Well, I have to thank the organizers very much for putting me on after Dom. Um, and also for him revealing when I'm walking around the stage, which I do tend to do quite a lot, the exact reason why I'm doing it. Um, I'm just an architect. Uh, I studied and graduated, and I did what a lot of architects do. They go and work and design private homes. Um, I found that process very insular. I was dealing with just with one client. When you finished the project, you handed over the keys, and you never saw it again. Unless you were very lucky, and you went back maybe, and you did the snagging five months later or six months later, and you got to see how they destroyed the building that you'd cared so much about. And the other problem for me was that when I then went out and socialized with my friends who were non-architects, they really weren't that interested in what I was doing. So I went to Australia, and I was very fortunate to start working on sports projects. And I started small, cut my teeth on the Olympic Stadium for the Sydney Games, 115,000 seats, uh, global audience of 4 billion people. And then I thought, well, this is pretty great, because everyone I speak to down the pub, et cetera, has an opinion. They're interested. It might be they interested in the event. They might be interested in the building. They might not like the building. They might not like how much the building's costing. But they're interested. And I also love the fact that these buildings are experienced by millions of people during their life. I'm not just working for one person anymore. I'm working for an enormous community of people. And that really sparked something inside of me. And it sparked a, started a 20-year journey where I've put an arena inside the Millennium Dome and rebranded it the O2. I've stuck a moving roof on top of Centre Court at Wimbledon. Um, and more, most recently, I've worked on the transformation of the Olympic Stadium in London. But the thing that ties all these projects together is a sense of community and people. And I think what I'd like to cover today is talking about the definition of community, because community can mean so many things. And I think particularly the way society is evolving, that community is changing. And our buildings and our approach as designers has to change to accordingly. This is a somewhat romantic vision of how football and sport used to be in communities. And it, you all know the story, stadium at the end of the street, people walking to that stadium, um, living in the terrace houses around it, going to watch, I mean, the beauty of watching a game of football at the same time every Saturday and having a ritual instead of it being moved around constantly so you had to change all your train times. This happened every time. It was a part of the community. You watched players who you grew up with, who grew up at the end of the street, and you socialized with them. And the experience of going to these games was so much more than just the venue. It was about the journey. It was about going to the pubs that surrounded these stadiums. And the stadiums themselves were quirky and interesting. You know, they were fitted into strange little spaces. They, they grew to, to fill little gaps and try and fit people in. And the only way that people got into these stadiums or they, no one talked about capacity. No one talked about sight lines. You know, I mean, this is somewhat creative ways to, to view a match. And, you know, they, we would call this multi-purposing now, the way people are on the pylons. But, you know, the reality is that there was a sense of authenticity. The, no one really talked about stadia and community because they were part of the fabric of our lives. And to a certain degree, this, this authenticity is something that we've been striving to get ever since. We went through a phase when you know, stadiums grew because of um, the need to generate more revenue as the cost of sport increased. They crammed more hospitality. They increased in terms of their comfort and necessary safety. But the reality was that these stadiums then grew and they got too big and they got moved out of their wonderful community urban locations. And the net result of this was that all of a sudden, these stadiums that were the fabric of our lives became places that we had to go to. We became beholden on the car. We became, basically, our whole experience was shifted. We didn't go to the pub before anymore. Everything was under this one roof. And this is a picture of Memorial Stadium in Baltimore. I show it because, at the time, the Orioles and the Colts played there, and that's an NFL and a um, baseball team. And the Colts moved out of town, and basically the baseball team was left with this concrete edifice that they didn't want to use. So the city were desperate to keep them. So they gave them this site in Camden Yards in downtown. And we built this stadium in Camden Yards, which became known as the ballpark that forever changed baseball. Now this was 25 years ago, and we, you can see in the bottom left this big long building, which is the B&O Warehouse building. And we kept it in its place, and we didn't move it. And as a consequence of that, the outfield's a funny shape. You know, you don't have to have the same size outfield in, in baseball. And this is how the old ballparks used to be. They used to be quirky. They used to be identifiable. They used to have some community affinity. 
And Camden Yards changed baseball forever. It basically it raised the issue of bringing stadiums downtown, about creating spaces where people would meet, where they would walk to. It reaffirmed all those old principles which were part of stadium and community. I'm currently working at Fulham, and Fulham is really an issue where we don't have to find history. This stadium was built in 1896. It's in the same location. You can see the rows of terrace houses that led to the stadium and the, and the listed stand that's on Stevenage Road. But we're working on the Riverside stand, and unfortunately the Riverside stand was rebuilt in 1970. And what was a wonderful place to watch football, where they literally said you could turn your head and watch the boat race going past you on the other side. All of a sudden, this 70 stand just cut off the river walk. And, this, and Fulham's actually quite close to our office, so I kind of run around the river walk, and then I have to run around the stadium because I can't go down the river walk anymore. So this isn't just a personally motivated project, but it's, it has some knock-on benefits. And what we've done is we've taken, reconsidered the idea of the Riverside Stadium. And we've completely changed the dynamic. We've basically said, look, this is a piece of community we want to reestablish. We're going to reinsert a community hub here that's bars, restaurants, there's pocket living. There's some really interesting spaces that will be used all the time and bring that Riverside to, light, to life. And yeah, 20 times a year, 25 times a year, there's a football match that will take place. And when that happens, we repurpose the facilities but far better to have a building that's designed for 365 days a year for the community that repurposes the riverfront than to have a building that's designed just for the football fans and turns its back on its community. This question really came to us when we got asked to do some design work for Real Madrid. Now, we've moved on a lot, society's moved on, and now we're talking about a global audience. And this is the Bernabeu in, uh, in 1947. And it had all the features that a lot of successful stadia did then. It was obviously very large. Madrid were a successful team even at that stage. But now we've moved on to a point where Real Madrid is a global sporting brand. They have allegedly 300 million fans. They have 150 million followers on social media. And they sold 2.3 million replica shirts last year. Now, I mean, those figures are astronomical. And they basically show that we're no longer dependent on ticket sales or hospitality. The new revenues are TV broadcast rights and global revenues. So how do you connect those 300 million global audience that are all wanting to buy replica shirts to the local audience that creates the passion? And so what we did was we took the, the concept of arrival and we took the concept of logging on to a mobile device to watch a match. And we said, well, what if we make that experience equivalent to entering a stadium? So we embedded LEDs on the facade of the design, and we created a global map. So as you enter the building for match day, at the same time, people are connecting and logging on online to watch digitally. And as they log online, a light goes on in their region, and those lights get brighter depending on how many people are connecting. So this, in, the whole idea of arrival, local and global, is connected at once. Inside the stadium, we wanted to connect the match day celebrations. So we had the concept of basically taking a 360-degree LED screen inside the stadium. And we connected live feeds from all the fan zones and fan clubs around the world that watched the game. And so as the fans inside the stadium celebrated a goal, so too did the fans around the world. So they're joined in their celebration. There's a sense of purpose. I love this, I love this tweet because basically Manchester City is the first club to try and create a global family of sports teams. They, apart from Manchester City, you may be aware, they have a team in New York, they have a team in Melbourne, they have a team in Yokohama, they have a team in Girona, um, they have a team in Uruguay. And this tweet, I don't know how good your Spanish is, but basically the last sentence is basically saying, and they say we have no history. Well, fine, but this is a tweet that's on Manchester City's Mexico feed, trying to educate new fans that they had a history before they moved into their new stadium and moved away from the community in, at Main Road. And a lot of our work is about trying to re-establish that community and that authenticity. And we've been working really hard to create a new destination. And creating this destination is about creating spaces that people want to become. I mean, City's big conversation is they want people to be active participants in the story. They don't want them to be passive spectators. And this is really interesting because they're trying to connect all these families of football clubs together under common shared values. But at the same time, they've got to connect over different time zones, they've got to extend the duration of the experience, and they've got to repurpose 
Etihad Stadium to have the same authenticity that the fans used to experience when they were going to Main Road? And how do you pass that authenticity down different generations when you've moved stadium three times and you're no longer in your spiritual home when you were originally part of the community? We didn't just look at the fans from Man City and how, what we could do to help them. We also looked at the away fans. And it seems like a very strange kind of approach to consider the small number of fans that sit in the stadium from the away teams. But actually, the away fans are the most valuable fans in a football stadium. If you think it through, there'd be no tribal atmosphere within a football stadium. There'd be no huge rivalry going on, songs going backwards and forwards. And to a greater and lesser extent, it's this atmosphere, it's this energy and tension that comes through the television set and is, makes the Premier League such an attractive proposition and drives the broadcast rights to the levels they are today. We also were trying to counter the, the challenge that you have within football stadia now and stadia generally of fans are very much, they, they're disconnected from the players. They, they can't relate to their enormous salaries. The players haven't grown up down the street with them. They're lacking this natural emotional connection. And as a community, what they, what they find is that they, and the high ticket prices, they find that they want, their, want to go there and be entertained. They're very much the theater goers of the, of the past. They go there and they, they, they say, well, we're paying a lot of money for our tickets. We deserve to be entertained for that money. So football grounds getting quieter and quieter. And it's a real issue because as they rely on global revenues and they rely on global audience, it's so important that that tension and energy comes through the television set. Whilst the concept of community is evolving and it's moved from local to global, the other concept that's changing or the other reality that we're having to deal with as designers, and probably the one that makes me feel less like an architect but more like an experiential designer now, is considering the journey and the spaces around the stadium. We're, all the time, we're really coming back to that, that community image before about how people moved and had experiences before they got into the stadium and afterwards. I think when we talk about designing for the evolving visitor, there's a couple of fundamental shifts. We're, we've begun to deal with the millennial generation. We've begun to deal with the use of mobile phones, the, the Wi-Fi and broadband required within our venues. And it's very true that millennial generation were very much a document and share generation. You know, it's, a, it's, it's typified by the apps that uh, are proliferated in, in the time which of, of kind of Instagram, et cetera, which is pretty much capturing and then so. Whereas Generation Z is very, a very different generation. They're the, we want to be present both in the digital world and also the physical world simultaneously. And we want to share those, emo those emotions and those experiences in real time. And for us, that creates a fascinating dynamic. And I think you have to be realistic about this because when the recent survey done, when they considered the Generation Z audience, and you know, they were asked to rate in, in order of importance you know, what they couldn't live without. And possibly reassuringly, they said at number 10, water, which is good. Um, it's all very good until they get to number one, which was their mobile phones. So you realize the challenge that we're trying to deal with. They probably thought that they could just text or ring someone to get water, so it wasn't that important. But we're then trying to create venues that are driven by a completely different mindset and generation. My son's 13, and he hasn't got the patience to sit down and watch TV broadcasts of sporting events. He'll go straight on Twitter, see the highlights. He'll go on Snapchat. He'll share information. He's just not interested anymore. He'll spend more time on Twitch than he will on any other on the, the normal TV platform. And the reality of that is that, you know, last month Twitch had more users than, or more viewers than um, MBO, um, Netflix, uh, ESPN combined. And this is only going to increase, and the importance of gaming becomes ever more prevalent. So when we talk about the communities of the future, I'll just leave you with a couple of conceptual images. And that's basically, this is the new esports community village. This is the digital version for the Gen Z of, of what I started the slides with, the old black and white slides. We've got an eSport arena, we've got an elite training facility, we've got a drone racing course, but all the surfaces, all the spaces around are completely driven by the need to continuously share information flow and correspond with each other. We've got experiential boulevards, we've got dynamic media facades, we've got all this character and, and community is going to be changed by the way we connect as individuals. And the last slide here is really just showing the concept of the global live site. 
four destinations around the world, all connected up, all competing. And here you see this complete translation here from going from community in terms of competition, in terms of local and being very parochial, to cities and nations competing with each other, all simultaneously, all sharing the local and global experience together. And I think that's the way our communities will head in the future. Thank you very much for your time.